long been at secondary school and we were beginning our studies of the French language. And one young boy asked the French teacher how it was that there are different languages and apparently so many of them. How did they originate? And another uh, boy in the class, a rather naive lad, as, as we found him later to be, I don't say he was naive because of his observation here and now, but uh, just his demeanour. Later on we discovered him to be rather naive. But um, bless him, he, he said that it was because of the Tower of Babel. Um, this was a story he'd obviously heard and learned, probably through Sunday school. And um, to my regret, my lasting regret, I didn't stand up to support him uh, when he came in um, for a little bit of light-hearted ridicule from the teacher and the rest of the class for his observations. In truth, I didn't then feel well equipped to argue the case and decided instead to bide my time. And this talk, I guess, stems from that. Uh, this is my attempt to put right that which I should have done many, many years ago. Uh, the, the talk was um, quite a long time in gestation, um, and as I finally got around to uh, putting my thoughts together, it developed into something sort of a little bit more, but we'll see a little bit more of that later on. I suspect few would hold the view which this young lad dared to voice, even amongst those who would profess to be Bible believers. Most regard it as a myth, a bit of a tall story, if you will, a tale told to illustrate a point without being intended literally. But if it's not taken literally, then we must ask what point, what lesson is contained within the story? I can't see one myself. The only value of this story seems to me to lie in the detail and is predicated upon an acceptance of its historicity. Take this away and there seems to be little of value left. If I read a book or watch a film, I can accept an imagined scenario, even a fantasy one, for the purposes of enjoyment of the, of the book or the film, so long as the plot is logical and consistent within its assumed parameters. If not, then it irks me and it spoils the story. I'm also of the opinion that our set of beliefs regarding life, our understanding of ourselves and of our universe, its origins and its destiny must also be uh, internally cohesive and consistent. I have discussions with a number of colleagues, I've done over the years, about my faith and, and theirs, if they have one. Um, I believe everybody does have a faith. It's possibly not a religious faith as such, but they, they have a, a religious standpoint, even if that's from an atheistic <coughs> perspective. But they will argue one thing on one day and something different on another day, which if you actually stop and bring the two ideas together, they're kind of mutually incompatible. And this doesn't seem to trouble them. It troubles me. I find also that if I'm to be fully engaged by a story, then it must ring true. It, I cannot, for example, accept that favourite notion of detective stories um, where, say, a shop assistant is asked um, to recall a customer who passed through their store t some ten years previously. And I'm sure you've all seen or read the sort of thing, you know, and they, they muse for a few moments and then they say, oh, yes, they paid by credit card. They bought such and such a, an item. I can't remember some of the people I met last week, never mind ten years ago, and to me it just doesn't ring true. I like to know if I'm reading something and if I'm reading the Bible, I have to test it. Does it ring true? Does it speak to what I understand? So whatever our preferred view of life and, and its origins, it must satisfy for me those same sort of tests. My challenge tonight then is to show you that the Bible account of the Tower of Babel affords a far more credible and satisfactory uh, explanation for the existence of multiple languages than the alternative and to try to share with you my enthusiasm for the beauty, the elegance and the logic of the scriptures. That last bit is where uh, the talk may become just a little bit challenging. Um, as I say, it was some years, a uh, well, couple of years probably in the gestation as, as I marshalled my thoughts and ideas and as I actually got around to preparing the talk, there was a programme on television which 
really seemed to take me on another stage. And, and it was a gift, and I couldn't, therefore, ig ignore it. I had to sort of take the story on that a little bit, um, although I am aware that that perhaps will be a little bit of a challenge. So I want to show later on that language is, an in is intrinsic to the scriptures and to the fundamental laws governing creation, and I will try to convey my enthusiasm and, and drag you along with me uh, in that. So please bear with me as we, as we work through this evening. So first, a brief summary of the key points of the story that we've just read together. After a flood which destroyed nearly everybody because of their gross wickedness, God told uh, the, those few that he'd saved alive to go out and repopulate the earth. And after a few generations, as numbers grew, they were supposed to spread out around the world to repeople it. Instead, in disobedience to God, they chose to build a skyscraper for themselves. That's what we call it today, a tower that reached to heaven, a skyscraper. Same difference, slightly different words, same, uh, same idea. A landmark to which they could all look and which was intended to be a focus for them, to make a name for themselves, to keep them together. Somewhere they could look and say, that's where our name is, that's where we belong together. Verse 4 of our chapter is quite clear on this point. Um, this quotation taken from the New King James Version, uh, as we've noted on the slide. And they said, come, let us build ourselves a city and a tower whose top is in the heavens. Let us make a name for ourselves, lest we be scattered abroad over the face of the whole earth. But that was what God had commanded them to do, to be spread abroad, to go and repopulate the earth. So two questions then following on from, as I say, the challenges that I set for myself or that I set stories that I'm reading, uh, that certainly those that purport to be factual accounts, as this one does, it sells itself as a factual account, I need to test it. Does it ring true? Does it uh, make sense and is it consistent? So throughout history, what has been mankind's track record on obedience to God? I think we know the answer to that. So that's kind of question number one. And number two, do men like building tall buildings to make a name for themselves, to show off? Well, what do we think on that? Um, I looked for some slides, and uh, this was one. It's a little, um, little out of date now, in as much as some of those buildings were in the planning uh, at the stage that uh, I grabbed them from the internet. Um, some of them have now been completed. That's just a, a slightly closer view of some of them. You will see over to the um, extreme uh, right-hand side of the, uh, of the image there, the Twin Towers. Um, it was noted on, these, on this slide that they have been destroyed, at, even at the point of that slide. But the Burj Dubai there um, was still under construction at the time. Uh, that was the, um, its eventual height to be... Um, over 2,000 feet, but it's noted on there that it, the actual height was a, a secret because it would have been too easy for others just to go that little bit taller. Um, so, it, although it's not that tricky to work out what it is, triangulation, or you can work these things out. But anyway, um, whilst we wouldn't really expect there to be archaeological remains of the Tower of Babel itself, the tower in question, there are remains of ziggurats, which well, well could be it. And certainly this idea, this concept of building a tower to make a name, it, it's what mankind has done throughout history. The whole reason that they go tall with all of these buildings is because they want to show off. They want to be bigger and better than the previous one that's built. They want to show off. They want to make a name for themselves. So the story here, as we're reading, it is entirely consistent with human nature and with what we, what we know of mankind. And as we say, the, um, the pattern could well be um, after this idea of the ziggurat. Um, this is a reconstructed facade of Ernamu's ziggurat. Um, and it's uh, based upon um, some, uh, an, an impression, an idea that was put together um, by Sir Leonard Woolley. Uh, the, the reconstruction that we saw is um, of an ancient ziggurat at Ali Air Base in Iraq uh, taken and the photograph was taken in 2005 and the the diagram there the impression is um, uh, from uh, a 1939 construction by Leonard Woolley um, and the the reconstructed facade is is based upon that 
So that is a little bit of background, perhaps, to the Tower of Babel itself and the, and the record and the story, and we see that it rings true. But what about the alternative? If we reject this account of the origins of multiple languages, then we have to ask ourselves, is there an alternative that has as much credibility? And it seems to me that the only obvious reason to reject this explanation uh, that we read in the Bible is because it's in Genesis and is deemed to be all part of the mythical account, as people see it, of creation. So let's for a moment or two think about that mythical account, and, uh, and in particular its relevance to the development of language. How many extant languages would you say there are in the world? It's a rhetorical question. You can answer it for yourselves in your head. I don't expect you to sort of be shouting, uh, shouting out ideas, but uh, we might be going higher, higher, lower, lower. But uh, there's, um, it might surprise you to learn that uh, the, the, the answer is quite staggering. There are apparently close to 7,000 languages extant in the world. Some are apparently only spoken by one person which rather calls into question their value as a tool of communication and their right to be called a language. But uh, that's, um, that, that's what I found, what I read uh, when I was researching this. Others are reckoned to be little more than dialects uh, rather than languages in their own right. Um, there is some confusion over this. And our next slide um, sort of is, is a quotation uh, uh, that sort of suggests an idea of the difference. But the particular slide on screen at the moment, uh, it's um, just the top 10 out of 7,000 odd languages and the, the top, oh, going on too many, wrong button there, let's get back, there's the, uh, so when it comes up, in its own time, there we go, so the top 10 languages, Mandarin, we might have thought it would have been English, but top Mandarin, this is by numbers of people, numbers of native speakers, then we've got Spanish, English is in third place. Um, this is just to give an idea of some of the languages. We see a, we'll see a, another view of this slide uh, later on, but this is just sort of population of the world that speak it and uh, where it's mainly spoken. Um, but our quotation that um, summarises nicely the, uh, the difference between a language and a dialect. A language is a dialect with an army and a navy. Uh, it's one of those little truisms that uh, you think, yeah, that's just about nailed it. Um, now this was taken from a weblog page for applied language, that quotation. Applied Language is a company specialising in translation and interpreting services. They offer 6,909 as the number of extant languages. So we said close to 7,000, they've got 6,909, which seems a very precise figure. Um, and I don't know quite how they've sort of come to that, but language is their business, and I assume they know what they're talking about. They do say that only about 200 are regularly translated by their offices. 100 interpreted, 200 translated. But that's still a lot of languages. Now, as we've said, many languages may be considered as little more than dialects. However, there are others which, though more distinct, stand fairly closely related. Spanish and Portuguese, for example, or German and Dutch. The languages can be grouped into families based upon similar word origins and grammar but they can't all be grouped into a single family. A quick look at the word window serves to illustrate that point. In Latin, the word was fenestra, and most of the so-called Romance languages, those with Roman origins, the Romance languages, have words clearly derived from this, and so we see the Latin fenestra, French fenetra, those who know French, I'm sure, would uh, recognise that the circumflex over the second E there, just before the T, replaces an S. Um, where you see the circumflex over an E, there used to be an S adjacent to it. So, fenestra becomes fenetra. In Italian, Italian, finestra. German, fenster. And Swedish, fairly close, fonstret. That might surprise us, because Swedish is um, uh, not a language we would have expected necessarily to be associated with the, the Romance languages. We would have thought possibly it would be more connected with Norwegian. English, which borrows a lot from Latin and, and uh, Greek um, and often closely associated with some of the French words, has window 
much more closely related to that Norwegian word, vinduet. Um, and if there are any Norwegian speakers in the audience, my apologies, that uh, I am reliably informed should actually be vindu. Um, but when you ask Google what, uh, what the Norwegian for window is, it comes with vinduet. Uh, apparently that means the window. But anyway, that's, um, I've been reliably informed when I've given this talk before. Um, but you'll notice the Hebrew there um, is not only a completely different word, but it even has different alphabets, it, uh, di different letters. It's, it's written in a different alphabet. It's, it's written quite differently. So we have um, the English word window um, being associated with this Norwegian uh, word vinduet. Although we do have, uh, in another context, the word fenestration to talk about the architectural placement of windows, and that sort of is associated, obviously, with the Latin fenetra, uh, fenestra. So English being a very acquisitive as a language, we've acquired words from, from everywhere and, and sort of built them into, into English. So although many English words can be tracked back to Latin and some to, to Greek, we've kind of gathered, uh, gathered words from, from everywhere. But a recent article on the BBC website says... According to the Ethnologue database, that's the database from which the previous slide, uh, the, the slide of all the languages was taken, that's uh, another view of it here, more than a hundred language families exist. Um, that's language families, not languages, language families. This is the Ethnologue database. The article continues, the Indo-European family is one of the largest families, more than 400 languages spoken in at least 60 countries, and its origins are unclear. And it goes on to discuss the origins of this particular language. Now, the fact that it's trying to look at the origins of one language within a group, within one family, and it doesn't track it back all the way to the beginning, it says that there are families which cannot be tracked back to a single one. This slide here shows um, from the Mandarin, that's in the Sino-Tibetan Chinese family, Spanish, Indo-European Romance, English, Indo-European Germanic. On that side, down there. And we'll see that there are the different families, but they cannot all be traced back to one single language. Before the days of easy global communication, migration and separation led to isolated communities. With little contact between these, except along trade routes, variation inevitably crept in to that which had been a common language. New words were invented as they were needed, and pronunciations altered. But if they had all derived from a single source, we would expect to be able to trace them all back to that source. But that is not what we find. Incidentally, um, we see this development of language um, from a common source. When we look at American and American English and UK English, it's sometimes said that America and uh, Britain are two countries separated by a common language. And we know, for example, that we talk about a pavement where the Americans have a sidewalk. We put petrol in our cars, they put gasoline. Um, and when I was looking for my buildings slide earlier, I came across a rather nice one. The Pants Building. And of course my initial reaction when I saw the Pants Building, I thought well, perhaps it's not a very good one. Um, and so it sort of acquired that epithet. But um, you'll see actually the reason why it's called the Pants Building. There we go. It looks like a pair of trousers, which of course in America uh, they know as pants. Um, and hence the pants building. So we see this kind of idea of, of, of language. It develops as new ideas are, are brought about, as new things need to be named, and we develop from a common lang from a common parent language. We get new words in, but the overlying uh, structure, the grammatical structure, remains constant. It remains there, and we just bolt on a few new words. They are different, and we can see, therefore, the development of language from an original parent language. But we can't take these many parents back to one single parent. Since we cannot trace a common ancestor, there is only one conclusion. The forerunners of the 100 or so language families must have come into being separately in 100 or so diverse territories. This is if we reject the Tower of Babel uh, idea of a, a differentiation of language being a means of driving people apart and, and incidentally what better way of separating a group of people 
you know how it is when we come in and you want people to be in discussion groups and you give them sort of little coloured badges or something on their lapel or you tell them that you're in group A, you're in B or you're in C and we're supposed to go into those groups. Uh, it's a challenge sometimes to make sure that people go to the right groups. They want to go and sit with their friend or, you know, whatever. But if you want to drive people apart, confuse the language. The groups will naturally move apart uh, in those sort of numbers that, that speak the same language and they will move apart away from those that can't communicate with them. The story is absolutely spot on in terms of what you would try to, what you would do if you wanted to achieve the ideal that God was setting out to do. That is consistent. If we're trying to answer the story differently and say that language has come about um, through um, 100 different evolutionary lines, well, just think about that for the moment. Uh, forgive my um, weird sense of humour with this slide. It just sort of, uh, it made me feel good when I put it together, just to have a little bit of amusement. But, um, but that's basically what we're saying, that if we've got a hundred different language families, then language must have evolved in a hundred separate lines. Because otherwise, if language evolved once and then separated, think about it, we would have one common parent from which others had derived. The fact we have a hundred or so language families which cannot trace, be traced back to a single parent means that language must have evolved some in, on one, some 100 separate occasions. Now, is this a reasonable proposition? Is this really likely? Speech is one of the key things that separates us from the rest of creation. It's a very complex process. In order to achieve the wide range of vocal sounds necessary for complex speech patterns, rather than mere grunts, a sophisticated mechanical apparatus is required. I, I could um, have a cheap shot here and say that it seems to come in late teenage years, that sort of movement away from the sort of the grunts, but I, I won't because I wouldn't want to offend anybody. Um, but you know what I'm saying, that um, animals do have com communication of sorts, uh, but it, it tends to be sort of the vocal, uh, the, the just sort of making of some kind of sounds. But the complex speech patterns that are necessary for, for speech um, require a complex um, piece of apparatus. Just think about it. That there that's, uh, that's showing, all of those elements that are listed have a part to play in producing speech. I find that quite staggering. Um, uh, then, then none, none of those pieces is, is redundant in this process. All of these play a part in producing and shaping the sounds that we use to achieve speech. Because for most of us, this comes very easily, and those who know me will say uh, for some more easily than others, uh, we may well take it for granted and not think too much about it. But all of this would be no use without a corresponding auditory response capable of resolving the complex sounds into something intelligible. And the brain also must be able to make sense of these sounds and to assign meanings to them. Meanings that are shared by both originator and hearer. It may be argued that monkeys, birds and other creatures have shared sounds for alarm calls, mating calls, etc. But the vocabulary is very limited. There are certainly there certainly appears to be no capacity for the expression of abstract concepts and philosophical ideas that we possess. What we have is a system which may be considered as irreducibly complex. In evolutionary terms, no part would be of any value without the whole. But evolution is supposed to be the process of development through incremental change. For a change to be adopted, it must confer some advantage. No part of this system would do so without the rest. It all has to be there or it would be of no value. The complexity of the neural processing necessary for language, for conversation as opposed to the mere mimicking of sounds, is quite remarkable. Again, just as we saw all of those elements of um, the, the skull necessary for speech, so language isn't centred in just one place in the brain. All across the brain we've got elements which are needed for the production of speech and understanding it, to have two-way communication. There have been reports in the press over recent years of um, animals able to make sounds that are supposed to be like human speech. We all know of minor birds and parrots 
but then of course there was that um, whale a while back wasn't there a beluga whale and uh, and an elephant if you recall in um, in Korea all of these were supposed to be able to um, produce some kind of speech but they possess no language skills really they're not forming intelligent communication when a child is born it has no language and during its early years it learns the necessary skills and develops the requisite neural capacity to process language. Uh, this is a non-specific skill by which I mean that it matters not what language it learns as long as it learns to speak, as long as it learns language. It can then go on to develop other languages, albeit those that are acquired early in life are um, intrinsic languages. They're, they're remembered easily um, through later life. Those acquired later are much more difficult to to grasp and you have to keep refreshing them they're more easily forgotten in rare cases a child has been deprived of the opportunity to develop language and um, it becomes very difficult it seems if they haven't acquired language by the age of 12 they probably won't be able to acquire language now although in experiment with very intensive rewards based training one or two great apes have been able to show a limited capacity to string words together this is by no means spontaneous and would never occur naturally. It's also intriguing to note that uh, they're taught to use sign language or pictograms, um, even though we keep being told that chimps, for example, share about 99% of our DNA. It's interesting that, uh, that the great apes are not able to mimic the sounds whilst they're being taught some rudimentary form of language. The, the creatures that don't get to sort of uh, build language are the ones that can mimic sounds. It's, uh, it, it's quite odd, isn't it? So language sets us apart from the animals. There is no obvious transitional stage in any animal that we know between the fairly rudimentary communication of danger signals and the like to the highly developed articulation of complex concepts and philosophical reasoning that we possess. To imagine that this should have appeared by chance once I think stretches credulity. To suggest it appeared independently in upwards of a hundred separate evolutionary lines through to man is quite preposterous. Yet language is fundamental to the human existence. Without it we would be incapable of communicating with each other or even with ourselves. And I don't mean talking to ourselves in the uh, quaint way. I mean, just think about when you're uh, planning ahead, when you're thinking about what you're going to do this evening, next week, even just thinking about a visit to the shops and constructing a list in your head of what you want to buy. How would you do that without language? We plan with language. If we don't have language, we cannot think ahead. We cannot plan ahead. Without language we would be unable to develop internally with the individual mind the intricately reasoned arguments that enable us to understand our world and our God. Without language we could not communicate with him or he with us. Language underpins all logical thought and reasoning but because it's innate within us I suspect few of us truly appreciate its import in these days of ultra-high speed communication, however, scientists are beginning to try to understand and quantify the place that communicable data has, not just in our lives, but within the very fabric of our universe. And we come now to what for me is the most sublimely persuasive aspect of our study, if, as we suggested at the beginning, the most challenging. So I was watching this television programme, as I said, um, it was presented by the ubiquitous Brian Cox, that um, professor who seems to be in residence in your television sets these days. He's, uh, every time you turn it on, he's, uh, he's there on one channel or another, isn't he? Um, and he's an engaging fellow, and he puts things across relatively easily. And I was watching this, uh, this programme um, on information theory and mentioned this chap, um, Claude Shannon, who, whilst working at Bell Labs in 1948 published his seminal work, A Mathematical Theory of Communication. And this set out to model communicable data mathematically. And it allowed the uh, development of the modern age of high speed communication. Uh, but also showed that information is intrinsic to the physical laws that govern our world. 
it's, it's thanks to this work that we have these mo um, wonderful gadgets, mobile phones, which is why I've sort of put them down there. These kind of, uh, these have come out of his, his work. Um, but his work carried on, it's much more fundamental than that. It, it, it's kind of in the early stages, but the, and this programme was sort of, you know, almost breaking new ground in sharing some of the ideas that come out of this. I'm sure we've all heard of Einstein's famous equation, E equals MC squared. It's probably the most famous equation there is. We might not understand it, but I'm sure we've heard of it. Uh, for those that don't understand it, and I'm, uh, trust me, no expert at all, um, but I do appreciate that the E represents energy, the M represents mass, and C represents a constant. So what the formula is saying is that the energy within a system, the universe, if you like, that we know, is equal to the, to the mass, the amount of stuff there is, that's all that mass means, it's the amount of stuff there is, multiplied by the square of some constant. And that constant, uh, quite fascinatingly, is the speed of light. Um, which is reckoned to be the fundamental constant within the universe and underpins all the physical laws that govern it. Um, now, I think that's absolutely fascinating when we bear in mind that God is the source of light, isn't he? And of himself, of his own power, God created everything in the universe. So from the energy, from the light which God is and possesses, he produced all the mass, all the stuff, all the... The, the matter that we see around us and having created it that balance is fixed and it's tied together by this constant the square of this constant which is the speed of light I think that's absolutely fascinating but one consequence of this idea this equation is um, the concept of the conservation of momentum in very simplistic terms the mass and energy are interchangeable but the sum of the two can never alter there is this equality between them. So in this television programme, talking about information theory and Claude Shannon, it, it was mentioned that this idea of the conservation principle has to be extended to include communicable data within it. Now, in this context, we recognise that information has a wider meaning than just our communications one with another. But it is no accident that information and communication are bound up with the, within the fundamental physical laws that govern our universe. Nor that we should possess the ability to reason and to understand and communicate. Because the Bible tells us at the beginning of John's Gospel record that in the beginning was the Word and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. That which is translated word in our English versions is the Greek word logos. And our word logic is sort of, it's associated, it comes from a similar, uh, a similar root word. Uh, we've already tried to show that these two, logic and, and speaking, uh, are, are in... In, undeniably linked and there's a connection between them they're absolutely connected without language without words we wouldn't be able to reason and to pursue logical thought and the development of ideas proverbs 8 says i wisdom dwell with prudence and find out knowledge and discretion the lord possessed me at the beginning of his way before his works of old and this passage is backed up by another in uh, the Old Testament where we, um, we look at Isaiah um, who speaks of the power of God's word in Isaiah 55 we read for as the rain comes down and the snow from heaven and do not return there but water the earth and make it uh, bring forth and bud that it may give seed to the sower and bread to the eater so shall my word be that goeth forth from my mouth it shall not return to me void but it shall accomplish what I please and it shall prosper in the thing for which I sent it God's word has power it's all connected with his, uh, his creative purpose and, and process God's entire plan and purpose with creation is founded upon wisdom and logic and this is revealed to us through his word, the Bible. And in Genesis, we read, Then God said, Let there be light. And there was light. God's creative plan with the earth began when he spoke. God said, Let there be light. 
and there was. Right at the beginning, this connection between information and light and matter or mass was established. The beauty and elegance of the wisdom and logic of God's word, when properly understood, is simply breathtaking. It's, it's sublime, isn't it? It's, it's absolutely wonderful. For the remaining days of creation, the same pattern is followed. And on day six, man was created in the image and likeness of God. And he was blessed with the capacity for rational thought and able to hear and speak. And as if to emphasise the point, the first task man was given to do was to name all of the animals. It was to use language to name the animals. Out of the ground, the Lord God formed every beast of the field and every bird of the air and brought them to Adam to see what he would call them. And whatever Adam called each living creature, that was its name. Sadly, of course, Adam and Eve failed to live according to the way God had asked of them and sin came into the world. And by chapter 8 of Genesis, things had become so bad that God decided to cleanse the earth by means of a flood. It was following this, of course, that he told Noah and his family to go and repopulate the earth, as we saw earlier. And it's symptomatic of the wickedness that came into the world through Adam, and which sadly was not removed um, by the flood, incidentally. Uh, it, it was just cleansed for a time, but it wasn't completely removed. Uh, it, it, that mankind rebelled against God and built the Tower of Babel as a landmark to enable them to stay together. For me, all the elements of this story ring true. Uh, they're totally consistent internally uh, with each other and with what we know of human nature and with the fundamental principles that govern all things, it seems. Now, as we said, the flood didn't remove sin from the earth. It merely removed for a time the worst excesses of it. Sadly, as we've seen all too soon, these traits of human nature manifest themselves again. However, the Creator does have, in his wisdom, a plan to remove sin from the earth completely. And this was revealed in Genesis 3 and is centred in the Lord Jesus Christ. He so fully epitomises the wisdom and logic of his Father's purpose and is such a clear revelation of that to us that he is described in John's Gospel record, as we said, uh, and as we saw earlier, as the Word made flesh. He came, of course, around 2,000 years ago to overcome the power of sin. And we believe that he will come again by God's grace very, very soon to begin the process of removing sin completely from the earth. And our final slide is taken from the prophet Zephaniah, a book we're perhaps not quite as familiar with as some of the other parts of the scripture. But it's wonderful when we read, therefore, wait for me, says the Lord. Until the day I rise up for plunder, my determination is to gather the nations to my assembly of kingdoms, to pour on them my indignation, all my fierce anger. All the earth shall be devoured with the fire of my jealousy. For then I will restore to the peoples a pure language, that they all may call on the name of the Lord to serve him with one accord. Now, however we read that, that's a pure language. That's not many that's a pure language. And if we think about what the Lord Jesus says about if thine eye be single, the words of the authorised uh, version recording what the Lord Jesus says, if thine eye be single, then is thy whole body full of light. And we understand that word single to mean pure. If thine eye be evil, then is thy body full of darkness. But there is this connection between single and pure. And when we read here that restore to the peoples a pure language it will be pure I think it will be a, a language that doesn't have words or concepts for impure ideas and, and, and thoughts but it will also be a single language it will be Babel reversed it will be bringing the peoples back to one shared language with which they will be able to call upon the name of the Lord and to serve him with one accord no longer separated, no longer driven apart, but to serve with one accord. We hope you will listen to God's word, both the Bible, his written word, and the Lord Jesus of whom it speaks, and wait with us for the return of the Lord Jesus and the return of that pure language. Thanks for listening.